All right. Well, I think we'll get started now um, while people are trickling in. So thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining us for this webinar. Um, we're so honored to have Dr. Erin McKinney with us here today. Um, if she looks familiar to any of you, um, she gave a 30-minute presentation at our 2018 Whole Grains Council Conference in Seattle. Um, so we can link that video uh, in the chat box if you're interested. Um, but she talked about whole grains and the microbiome. And today we're really excited that we have a chance to dive into this topic more deeply um, by using the lens of sourdough. And so before I hand the mic over to Dr. McKinney, um, I just want to make a few housekeeping notes. So um, viewing this live webinar is eligible for one CPEU credit for RDs. And we'll send you guys a follow-up email later this week, um, everyone who's viewing it, um, with the details about the credits. So stay tuned for that. And we also hope to make the slides available after this webinar. Um, it may be a subset of the slides um, because Dr. Kenny uh, McKinney will be sharing some exciting work um, that hasn't been published yet. So, um, so kind of her to give us a sneak peek to this. Um, so we just want to make sure that um, we have everything in order and all our permissions are set before we post it. So it might take us a few days longer than it usually does, um, but we definitely do hope to be able to share um, the slides with you as well. And we will be recording this session. Um, but again, we may need to edit it a little bit. We'll talk about that more offline, um, but um, we'll definitely get you guys something um, so that you can reference it. And uh, other than that, if you think of questions throughout this session that you want to ask, um, you can type those into the chat box. And then at the end, um, we'll open it up for questions as time allows. So yeah, I'll hand it over to you now if you'd like to introduce yourself. All right, yeah, hi everybody. Thanks for tuning in this afternoon. Um, it's, it's awesome to be back involved again with Old Ways, with the Whole Grain Conference. I'm so excited. So thanks for inviting me back. Thanks for having me here, wherever here is for you today. Um, so what I'm going to do really quick is share my screen so that you can follow along with my slides. So you should see my title, right? Simple, uh, easy, sourdough, right? And just a little bit of background for, about me uh, in case you weren't at the conference in 2018 or, or don't remember, quite understandable. Um, I'm coming at whole grains from the idea of holistic health. So I got a master's and a PhD studying gut microbes you have you know, a galaxy of superheroes of, of sidekicks living in your colon right now. Everything that you eat is a taste of the world around you. It not only helps to kind of educate your immune system, but it also helps to grow these thriving communities in your colon that help you develop from day one of life and even before. Um, the, you know, compounds of those uh, tiny critters are producing when they digest your food their waste becomes chemical signals to your brain telling you about the world some of the cravings that you have may not actually be your cravings right maybe you're responding to messages from your gut microbiome um, their compounds also influence our health uh, directly via nutrition and uh, also via other health measures right so um, imbalances in the gut microbiome have now been tied to inflammatory uh, responses and diseases, everything from irritable bowel syndrome um, to, you know, to um, toddler's temper tantrums, right? That's on my mind because I have a two-year-old now. So um, I'm coming at this not only from thinking about whole grains as a single input, but thinking about all the ripple effects that those whole grains can have for your health through the gut microbiome. So a quick overview of this talk, I'm going to talk to you about how to grow a starter. We'll have a demo. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you about why starter is so popular in like the world zeitgeist right now, especially in COVID. Um, and like what is happening in that jar anyway? So then we'll really dive deep into the science of sourdough. So part one, um, how to make a starter. This is a graphic 
method protocol, I think in pictures, um, I work with a lot of uh, community members, including students in public schools, everyone from kindergarten to, you know, I've worked with students with, from age five to 85. Um, so sometimes pictures really help to communicate those uh, messages. I have developed a protocol, um, what I'll demonstrate for you, uh, just starting with um, step one, mixing that flour and water, right? There are different projects that I've helped develop. Sourdough for science involves collecting the height and pH measurements. If you don't have pH paper, you can just do uh, the wild sourdough project. So I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen. So you should just be able to see me big again. And I'm going to show you just how do you make a starter? So I like to do this. I've scaled this down for um, a half pint jar. So this jar holds, you know, one cup. It's a wide mouth jar, so I can reach in and stir really easily. It's glass, so I can see straight through, see what's going on. And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to demonstrate with all-purpose flour because it's cheap and I don't mind using a lot of it and just tossing it in the compost later. But obviously you can use this and you are encouraged to do this with any type of whole grain flour that you have. So what I'm going to do is measure out two level cups, or two level cups, wow, that'd be a huge starter. We scaled this down for a reason, folks. Two level tablespoons of flour, and then I'm going to add to that two level tablespoons of water, so equal parts, right? And this water is just from the tap, um, but you can dechlorinate it um, by letting it sit out overnight. So, um, in, you know, in cities, uh, we add chlorine to our water to kill microbes that might potentially be pathogenic. We don't want to kill the microbes in a sourdough starter. The whole point of a starter is to grow microbes. So you can use dechlorinated water by just letting that chlorine evaporate out overnight. So I have, um, let's see, and I saw a chat just pop up. So if I see them in time, I will try to respond. I saw a chat question, gluten for your coconut flour. I have um, had a lot of students grow uh, starters with gluten-free flours. I've got, I've, spoiler alert, uh, I've got a couple starters to show you here in a minute that I've been growing specifically for this talk so I can demonstrate some differences between whole grains. Um, Coconut flour is difficult because it is so absorbent. The only, re I would be really keen to find out what happens if you could make a starter with coconut flour, but what I've found is it absorbs all the water all the time. So you get this really fluffy growing mound of coconut rehydrated, but it doesn't make a nice pasty starter. But it doesn't have to be whole wheat. It doesn't have to be all purpose. It doesn't have to be rye. This is part of the discovery process. So I've got equal parts of flour and water, and I am using my finger just to squeegee off. I just use a knife because I find that a lot of starter gets stuck in the bowl of a spoon. And I use the edge of the knife to scrape the starter down the sides of the jar. And that's just so that I get a clearer window of what the rise looks like on this starter over time, right? So two tablespoons flour, two tablespoons water. We've mixed it up, I've scraped it back down. And it's kind of a, the thickness of maybe applesauce, right? So there you go. And I might, as a, as a scientist, I might mark, this is an all purpose starter. And then I might even like to mark, there's the level that I started, right? Um, that's another beauty of glass. You can take off the Sharpie with ethanol, right? With any alcohol that you feel like you can spare in a pandemic. Um, and then you can draw a graph over time of how your starter is rising. So I mixed my flour and water. I'm then going to use a half sheet of um, paper towel and a rubber band. I've now rubber banded that paper towel over the top. This way, you're keeping chunks of stuff if for some reason some chunk of something flew you know through the air in your kitchen right again i have a two-year-old um <laughs> maybe you don't live in such an active environment um but it the paper towel does enable the microbes in your environment bacteria and yeast to filter in and to colonize that starter so we're starting with a glorified paper mache paste you'll want to put this somewhere 
that is about room temperature, whatever ambient is in your house, not in direct sunlight, right? Um, and just leave it for 24 hours. And after 24 hours, you'll come back to it and you'll refresh it. So you'll remove, and I can demonstrate that with, um, first I'll show you some starters and then I'll, I'll demonstrate the refreshing process. So here's a starter that I'm making with buckwheat, right? So I had it um, all paper toweled up. So you can see, you know, I started it on, I even date them, right? So I started it June 23rd. I'm going for 15 feedings. Um, so this is my day zero. And you can see there has not been a lot of growth over time. And right now we're on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? So I fed it for the ninth time. There's my start. And you can see there has not been a lot of activity. So there's buckwheat and I'm just going to leave it. I fed it at nine this morning. Um, so I'm finding uh, after a few days, after probably six feedings or so, I'm finding I can generally move to uh, two feedings a day, but it may vary by flower type. Right, so there's buckwheat. Just for comparison, I made one with teff because I also have teff. And another great thing about scaling this down to the half pint jar is you only need like a cup and a half to grow a starter for 14 days um, instead of needing a five pound bag of flour, right? So that should fit budget and it should hopefully fit, you know, any flour shortages that we're encountering. Um, it's also really useful for using up that last cup or two of flour that you might have of some strange exotic type of flour from your pantry. So just for comparison, see if I can coordinate my wrists here. So you can see Teff is a lot more active. You can even see those bubbles on the side of the jar, right? So those bubbles are um, a, a sure sign that we have a thriving yeast community that's starting to um, produce a lot of carbon dioxide. Um, and then again, this is this would be day eight, right? And I'm just gonna wait um, for the TEF, you know, you can see hopefully it should have ways to grow yet, right? So now I'll compare it just for comparison to David Doey, my sourdough starter, uh, that I generally feed with uh, all-purpose flour. Right, um, so all purpose, you know, it's, it's not the most exciting, but it's cheap and I don't mind discarding it. So um, it's my maintenance flour of choice. And then I tend to use a lot of whole grains when I'm actually uh, growing up the levain to bake with, right? So even compared to Teff, I fed it the same type, right? So you can see David Dowie's belly button right there, right on the side of the jar, that's where it started equal parts, um, but a mature starter fed with all-purpose flour, I mean, that's a thriving community. It's at least doubled in size uh, in the same amount of time, six hours since 9 a.m. And this guy, he's already, um, you can see the high tide mark. So that's the top. But if I actually look in uh, through the jar, um, in, I can see it's already hit that high tide mark and started to fall. So this is a super active starter. It's kind of like, you might be feeling like this right now since it's about, well, it's 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, I might be feeling this way, right? Like it's been a few hours since my last meal and I've, I've hit my peak and now like I'm running on adrenaline, right? The love of the crowd. Um, so that's a comparison of different activities, both from a mature starter to starters that are still in the process of growing and a comparison between two gluten-free flours. So I think that was a question as well uh, in the chat earlier. Can you use gluten-free flours? Absolutely, you can. I use a lot of gluten-free grains. Um, so once you have that starter that needs to be fed, I like to keep my discard in the fridge. So here I've got the full pint, again, a wide mouth jar, and this has two discards in it. So as you're growing your starter, I showed you with this first demo, two tablespoons of water, two tablespoons of flour. So just imagine the time trick, right? Oh, now it's time to feed our starter, right? So what I'm going to do is, well, first, ideally, I would mark that high tide mark, right? So I can see 
wow, look how much it grew, right? And that's, that's just if you want to do that and draw a graph for yourself on the side of your jar. Then I'm going to mix it. And you'll see as I'm mixing it, well, maybe difficult for you to see because it's so clingy on the sides of the jar. So I'll scrape as I go. So you can see as I mixed it, I've popped all those bubbles. It's like punching down your dough when you're making bread. So then you get just this tremendously tacky, thick paste that's alive, right? A thriving microbial community. You can see that was the difference of leavening agent, right? That was all carbon dioxide and other aromatic compounds um, that was that rise. And then I'm going to remove, you want to remove all but a tablespoon while you're growing your community. So what I'm doing here, I need more hands, right? I'm removing from this jar into my discard jar. You do not have to save your, um, your discard. I save my discard because every couple days I feed it, uh, I keep it in the fridge, and then I feed it, keep it out on the counter. So then I automatically have, instead of three tablespoons of starter, I'll have a cup or two cups. And then I'm ready to make crackers or pancakes or waffles or bread or you know whatever I'm wanting to make at that point. And I have um, some hyperlinks on my last slide, spoiler alert, with, um, with some of my favorite recipes that I use. So I've removed all but about a tablespoon in the starter. I'll put my fridge starter jar with my save discard into the fridge to keep for later and just keep adding to that. And then what do I mean by feed it? So if I had just left this starter when it was so uh, tall and glorious in the stop in the jar it would run out of sugars and starches and other nutrients from the flour the microbes would have eaten everything um, eventually uh, the yeast when it gets stressed like starved <laughs> it starts to make alcohol right so there are some applications like beer and wine brewing when we really want our yeast to make a lot of alcohol but you don't so much want that in bread right um, a lot of alcohol in your sourdough starter it, it forms a liquid layer on top of that risen uh, layer of starter and i would call that liquid layer hooch right? So a layer of liquid or of hooch on top of the starter just means your starter's very hungry. Um, so that might be a signal instead of feeding it once every 24 hours at the very beginning of your starter growing project, you might want to switch over to once uh, every 12 hours or about twice a day. This starter uh, was hungry, had already reached the high tide mark um, after six hours, right? So this starter wants to be fed three times a day or four. I don't have time for that. So a lot of times I will backslop it or I will remove enough starter that I have less than a tablespoon left in my jar. But these are all tips and tricks that you can use on down the line once you have a mature starter. The point of the feeding and refreshing step here is to remove at least half of the community of yeast and, and bacteria to make room for additional growth. Right? Otherwise, you would have to keep feeding it equal parts every time. So I would start with you know, two tablespoons of starter, and then I would have to feed it two tablespoons of flour and two tablespoons of water because it's always equal parts. And if I didn't split it in half and feed it, then I would have to feed it four tablespoons. So it would grow exponentially, and eventually this kitchen would be full of starter. And then this house would be full of starter, and then the neighborhood would be full of starter. So to avoid that, <laughs> delightfully gloppy mess. Um, that's why you cut it in half. That's why you discard all but one tablespoon. So now all I have to feed is um, one tablespoon of flour and one tablespoon of water. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, I'm checking and, and you can't quite all tell me, but I'll trust that that makes sense. So. I've got one tablespoon of flour, one tablespoon of water, one tablespoon of starter. And then I'm going to mix it all up. Uh, 
And there are different um, like recipes and protocols for feeding your sourdough starter. Some are one tablespoon of flour and one tablespoon of water. Some are one tablespoon of water and four teaspoons of flour, which gives you slightly more flour for a slightly thicker starter. So depending on uh, if you join one of our citizen science projects, then um, you'll need to pay attention to like the recipe that we use for the specific project. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, let's see. So, and I think I saw how often are you feeding that on the first day and the second and the third day, you may only need to feed once every 24 hours, right? So as you're starting your starter from scratch, you'll feed it once every 24 hours until you start to see either that it has reached a high tide and crashed again, right? That's a sign that I peaked and now I'm out of food, so I'm falling, right? Or especially if you see a layer of liquid on top of your starter, that's that hooch, that alcohol production made by starving yeasts. That is a sign of a hungry starter. So when you start to see a liquid layer on top, then you might want to feed it twice a day, okay? Um, so that's your demo for how to feed it. Um, and then I'm going to reshare my screen so we can move on to the um, aroma portion. Okay, so y'all can see this? Yeah, you can see my screen again? Perfect. Um, so after you fed your starter for those 14 days and it's fully mature, we're asking that you characterize it. So you, um, here's a picture of one of the incredible middle school teachers. She teaches sixth grade, as you can see on her shirt, very proud. Um, this is Kristen. She's smelling her starter to characterize the aroma. And what we've done is we've actually worked with some sensory scientists who have smelled hundreds of different starters and really tried to train their noses and their brains to recognize what different aromatic characteristics are they smelling in their starters. So since I just mixed up my all-purpose flour starter um, and I've, I've added new flour and water to it, it's, uh, those smells would be dilute. It's going to smell a lot more like flour and paste than it will like uh, whatever aromas the microbes and yeasts are producing. So instead I'm going to uh, do this with teff, right? So just smelling your starter, ideally you're going to want to um, stir it up first, right? So you'll stir it and that releases all of the aromatic compounds that are, you know, these bubbles down further in the jar. And you'll smell it and I'll, what we have here is moving out from the, so in that uh, aromatic wheel on the right, in the center you see an active bubbly happy starter. And then on that inner circle, um, you've got uh, these super categories. So I definitely smell a grain and a cereal kind of smell. So that orange, right, in the, what we we'll call it, the north and northeast corner, right? And I think it smells, I'm going to say it's deeper than porridge. I'm going to go with whole grain. I'm gonna say it's a whole grain smell, maybe a little porridge in there. And then I definitely get sour as well. So then uh, my other super category is that dark blue toward the bottom, right? Like south, southeast. <laughs> um, and I think it's sour, not fermented dairy. Because to me, it smells more like vinegar. So I'm gonna go with, you know, if I were submitting data for today, and I would say it smells like grain cereal, whole grain, porridge, and like sour vinegar. Those would be the descriptors that I would use. And the reason that we're asking you to use this supplied aroma wheel is so that um, we aren't biasing our observations based on our distinct life experiences, right? So like I eat a lot of Asian food, so I might also think about kimchi and soy sauce, um, but I also, you know, have drunk beer before. So I would be using a lot of beer and brewing descriptors, whereas folks who don't have those different life experiences or, you know, um, 
kind of food training experiences might not think of those same descriptors. So using the same aroma wheel helps all of our participants to use a common language. Does that make sense? Um, so when you smell your starter, you'll record which different aromas you're detecting. And you can see there are a number of different um, possibilities. Right, and I think we also have a submission category for others. So if you see very strongly, you know, uh, I'm going to have to use an other for my buckwheat because it smells so much. There's a lot of umami in my buckwheat starter. I think it smells like meat a lot of the time. It's very strange. It's like meat and dirt, <laughs> and maybe a little bit of sour. Um, so I would need an other category so I could include those meat descriptors. Right. So you smell your starter. Um, and so that's my demo for how to, how to prepare a starter and then how to smell it. And I'll tell you uh, as I'm moving on, because I want to make sure to cover everything else um, that I was asked to talk about today, um, on our Wild Sourdough website. Um, so in this slide in the lower right hand corner, I have a link to our Wild Sourdough project. We are curating an entire list of responses to FAQs. And we have a Facebook group where all of our participants engage in conversations with one another. Um, so we usually tend to say, you know, we're so appreciative that we've had We've had over a thousand submissions so far for this project that we started in mid-April. It's been an incredible response. Um, and we're really grateful that the community of participants is really welcoming and really engaging with each other regardless of their experience level. So um, if you have additional questions as you join this project, hopefully, and as you have questions about it, um, I'd encourage you to join that Facebook community and to look at our FAQ list. So that was actually a perfect segue. Um, why is sourdough so popular anyway, right? So particularly in these, um, in these times of pandemic, uh, I think probably all of y'all have noticed um, that you know, we are running out of a lot of things. <laughs> there are yeast shortages, uh, commercial yeast in the stores. Um, there are flour shortages a lot of times. So a lot of people are turning to you know, ways to make bread that don't depend on commercial yeast. And sourdough is actually one of humanity's oldest technologies. Right, um, For over 14,000 years, uh, humans have been baking bread. We used to think that this uh, didn't really start, that we didn't start doing this as uh, societies until we had agriculture, right? The best estimate used to, or the earliest estimate used to be with the ancient Egyptians, like looking at hieroglyphic murals. Um, you would see these uh, incredible pictures of, you know, the, the um, the milling process, the baking process. But recently, within the last year or two, uh, researchers in Jordan found evidence. Uh, they found ancient breadcrumbs at a, at a fireplace at a campsite um, by hunter-gatherers. So really incredible. Even before we were farming the grains, we were gathering grains um, from you know, the natural wilds uh, and fermenting those grains, pounding them, and baking bread. So, it's a big deal. It is a part, you know, microbial cultures are part of human cultures, right? Um, so it's been important for us as civilization in part because these bacteria and yeast um, settling in from the environment, right? Again, that's why we're using these uh, paper towel covers so that bacteria and yeast from your environment can filter into a glorified paper mache paste, right? And colonize it. Um, so those bacteria and yeast then are digesting the sugar and starch in your flour, whatever type of flour you decide to use. The bacteria then produce acid and acid is going to prolong the shelf life by preventing the growth of mold right, which is a fungus. Yeast is also a fungus, but yeast is a, a fungus that we want in there because it produces carbon dioxide, which actually makes your bread rise. Um, and yeast is importantly acid tolerant. The acid tends to kind of burn away uh, a lot of molds and other bacteria also uh, that tend to be uh, potential pathogens or highly opportunistic. 
right? So the production of acid by these lactic acid and acetic acid bacteria really helps to select for very specific microbial communities that not only extend shelf life, but also give sourdough bread its characteristic tangy flavor. And that fermentation process also has other beneficial results uh, for the consumer. Those yeasts, as I said, create carbon dioxide to make the bread rise, as well as other aromas that contribute to more flavors. Um, and this is where I'll just pause and say sourdough is a prebiotic, right? So I get asked all the time whether sourdough is a probiotic. So I want to take a moment to clarify these terms. Um, sourdough is a prebiotic, right? Um, whole grains especially are full of fiber and other compounds that help fuel a healthy gut microbiome. So if you think of probiotics, as living organisms, right? Probiotic foods then would be foods that contain living organisms like yogurt, kimchi, sauerkraut, kombucha. But while sourdough starters are chock full of thriving communities, which I'll talk about more in a minute, the baking process kills everything in the starter before you consume it, right? So again, sourdough is a prebiotic. It's a great food to help beneficial microbes grow in your gut, but it is not a living food in itself, right? However, before they die, the microbes and sourdough starters work incredible like fermentation magic or alchemy. They, when they digest the flour uh, in the starter, they synthesize vitamins, they decrease the glycemic index of sourdough, and they even digest some of the compounds that make up that gluten network. Um, to this last point, there is some evidence that gluten-sensitive consumers react less to sourdough, right? But I would not guarantee anything personally, and I certainly, uh, this doesn't apply to celiacs, right? Um, gluten sensitivity versus celiacs disease, like very different conditions. So just to make sure we have all our terminology correct, like don't tell your friends with celiacs to eat sourdough. <laughs> as long as we're all on the same page there. Um, and also the process of tending a starter and baking bread increases mindfulness. I find, you know, it's, I'm just paying attention every day. I'm taking five minutes out of my morning just to pay attention to flour in a jar. And I'm just doing, it's a cathartic tedium to stir, to scoop, to stir again, um, and to note, you know, what are the behaviors? What are the smells being produced and the rise being produced by my little microbial garden? So I've found that this sort of mindfulness practice um, helps to decrease stress, and that would be especially important in quarantine. So moving on, now let's really dive deep into um, a lot of the science behind what is happening in that jar, especially in these first two weeks of life for your starter, if you're growing your starter from scratch, right? On day one, if you tried to use this glorified paper mache paste to grow bread, you might feel like Hagrid, because you might come out with kind of a rock cake, right? There's your Harry Potter reference for the day. Um, so common practice, um, common wisdom, general baking expertise holds that you don't want to bake with a sourdough starter until between 10 and 14 days. Right? So I love thinking about the succession process um, for microbial communities. They can be so complex, or even in the case of more simple systems like sourdough, which is kind of like a gut in a jar if you think about it. Um, I think it's really interesting to really think about what is this process of going from pretty much nothing. It's like if you grew a forest from a, from a patch of bare dirt right? What plants are growing in what order? What's that process of succession? What are the rules about these complex communities? So the world is already convinced that sourdough is a wonderful thing and we should all make it, but now what's actually happening in that jar? To find out, I've helped to launch two different citizen science projects and worked with nearly 300 middle school students at four different schools here in Raleigh. Um, and we've, of course, launched this more broadly, so we now have participants from all over the world. Together, we've grown hundreds of sourdough starters um, from 10 or more different types of flowers to help find out how microbial communities change over time in a process called colonization. 
So diving right in, um, I used DNA sequencing. That was one of the methods. So I extracted, you know, from about a, a quarter teaspoon of starter. I took it into the lab. I extracted all the DNA from it. And then I amplified only a very small segment of DNA. It's kind of like a fingerprint gene that tells us the last names of all the bacteria living in these communities. And then using those different last names, I was able to match them to the different functions uh, that different family groups of bacteria have. And what I found is um, from day one to 14, you see no matter what flower type you're growing with, you see that the lactic acid bacteria tend to increase over time. They become highly dominant in these sourdough starters, no matter what you're feeding those starters. And those lactic acid bacteria produce acid, right? They're named for their function. Um, and so you can see as, um, as we got an increase in the proportion or in the uh, prevalence of those acid producing bacteria, you see the pH really drop. And regardless of flower type, this was so exciting to me. There's this precipitous drop. All of the starters start between 4.5 and 6 pH, so not quite neutral, but definitely not as acidic as they end up, right? And definitely from day two to three, there's a precipitous drop to a new normal right, of a lower pH, a higher acidity in the starter. And that acidity limits the broader bacterial diversity that's able to grow, right? So we knew that these trends existed before, but um, they'd never been demonstrated across the same time scale for so many different flower types at a time. So again, I've got my insets. You have, uh, as your starter grows, you have more and more lactic acid bacteria growing have um, the pH dropping as those LAB produce acid, and that acidity limits the growth of uh, other types of bacteria. And a lot of those other types of bacteria we find out do tend to be much more opportunistic. They can grow anywhere, right? So as the diversity decreases toward the right side of this graph, you have a selection for specific types of bacteria that are acid tolerant, right? But rye is an outlier. So when we look at just the broader diversity patterns, we can see, you know, TEF is doing something really wild, really low diversity in TEF. So it tends to be dominated by a couple types of microbes that take over the entire starter. But if we look just at the total number of different bacterial types present, we see that rye is an outlier. So that was really interesting to me. So next, I uh, worked with 66 students uh, who went to the North Carolina Governor School for Natural Science. So they're all rising high school seniors. This was in 2017. Um, so you can see a lot of times working with the public, um, with students in particular, it could take a long time to wrangle the data that you get, right? So what we did, uh, these 66 students came from all across the state of North Carolina. In their welcome letter, I said, you know, bring flour from home. So they showed up and they're like, I brought my flour. They said, great, we're going to grow the bacteria and the yeast. So on agar plates, they grew bacteria and yeast from each flower type. So I'm going to show you a series of pictures now. And each circle is going to represent the bacteria on the top half of that circle and the yeast on the bottom half that grew from different types of flour. All right, so I gave you a selection. I think we looked at 15 total different types of flower at Governor's School, but I'm showing you kind of the most relevant uh, types that had the most overlap with a DNA sequencing project, right? So if you look broadly, um, the first thing that I saw was all-purpose flower is the only one that doesn't have any yeast growing right? It has tons of bacteria, but like no yeast are growing. And I think that that is because if you look at the anatomy of a wheat kernel, right? All-purpose flour tends to have a lot more of the endosperm just from that milling process, whereas the germ inside and the bran on the outside, they tend to be nutritional inputs, but they tend to also have microbes associated with them um, that tend to be yeasts either from the field, uh, yeasts in the environment from the field on the bran, or yeasts that are so closely mutualistic with the plant um, that they grow inside of the seed. 
So all-purpose flour, ex by excluding most of the germ and most of the bran, all-purpose flour is also probably excluding most of those yeasts. The next thing that I noticed was that rye has a lot of different types of yeast and a lot of different types of bacteria. So um, that lines up with the diversity patterns that I saw. And I think that rye has, is able to support so many more different types of microbes because rye has a lot more beta amylase, right? So um, y'all might have heard of starch attack. Um, if you've ever worked with rye when you're making bread in the baking world, it's like a huge cautionary tale. Don't overwork your rye bread dough because it just turns into a huge sticky mess. It's because rye is chock full of the enzyme beta amylase that breaks down starch into sugar components. So that makes it really difficult to um, handle the dough because it's breaking down all the structure in the dough. Um, but it makes it really great for microbes because then all that sugar is readily available and it's a whole grain so you still have sugar and fiber and protein and lipid so you're getting like a well-rounded diet and a lot more sugar that's available so that's why i think rye starters can specifically uh, support so many more types of bacteria but i digress <laughs> um Getting back to that colonization story, another way that I can look at this data um, instead of giant tables of all the different types of bacteria is to represent each sample that we selected, right, from each starter. So each point is a different starter grown from a different flower type, sample on a different day. So uh, I have, you know, the different days that we sampled. Here's day one, here's day 14. Uh, day one is in turquoise, and then uh, on the left, and day 14 is in dark red on the right. So you can see this progression from left to right of the changing microbial communities over time. And then using computational analysis, I'm able to actually see which types of bacteria are, are really making those starters stand out from one another at these different time points. So again, Looking on the left side of this graph, I see there's a lot of Lactococcus pseudomonas, which is um, a plant associate, but also a potential pathogen. Enterobacteriaceae um, generally can be opportunistic, sometimes pathogens. Erwinia are associated with flower. Vicella and uh, Klebsiella tend to be associated with our bodies. So that's telling me that young starters are heavily influenced by microbes in flower in plants and on our bodies. But if we look, uh, if we shift our gaze to the right side of the figure, um, by day 14, we see Gluconobacter, Lactobacillus, and Pediococcus. That is a narrow range of acid producing bacteria. So that's telling me that by day 14, you have uh, a lower diversity of organisms that are highly adapted to the acidic environment in the starter. And if we want to look at this averaged over all of the different starters on day one, here we have a heat map of these different types of bacteria. Again, we have pseudomonas, so these opportunists that tend to be associated with our bodies tend to produce rotten bodily odors, right? Um, a lot of the middle schoolers uh, cited uh, flatulence and vomit, right? <laughs> As you do in seventh grade. Um, in that transition period from day two, day three, day six, right, you have a transition away from uh, those more bodily affiliates and you get a lot more sour production. So we're seeing more lactobacillus and lactococcus, lactic acid producing bacteria, and you can smell change. And then by day 10 to 14, you're smelling sour, but also bready smells that are coming from these predominantly lactic acid bacteria. Now, I also compared uh, all of those samples at day 14 across all the different flower types. So we can see even though all of the different flower type microbes are having similar journeys, they're ending up at different places, especially Teff. Teff is just wild. Why does it have so much Pediococcus? I mean, it's, it's gotta be about the grain or the nutrients, right? Um, 
So there are still mysteries to be solved with these sourdough starters. I'm really excited that not only are we starting to really see what effect does it have if I use specific different whole grains compared to your baseline uh, all-purpose flour, but then also seeing that the, those microbes are different, are producing different smells, and they're producing different breads. So these are my bread shots, um, my little bread portraits of, um, this is the same as Dr. McKenney's easy sourdough uh, recipe that's linked on our wild sourdough and sourdough for science websites. Um, and I just substituted, I think it was a half cup or a third cup of the just all purpose flour with each separate. Um, so at the top is uh, turkey wheat. This is Teff. Teff makes a very strange little loaf. It's all that pediococcus maybe. Um, and then I've got sorghum here. Um, this was emmer. I've got buckwheat second to the bottom. And then at the very bottom, I have amaranth. So you can see the different microbial membership has consequences, both for the smell and the performance of bread over time. So with that, um, I'll show you my links, um, you know, and these, these can be provided. I'm happy to share them in an email if that's an easier way to share them out. Um, and just some ideas of different ways to use different whole grains uh, that I like to use in my baking. So in bread, I've really started to enjoy uh, putting like a half cup of millet flour in with the rest of my whole wheat or rye. Um, for crackers, I mean, amaranth crackers, there's something about them. It's like, it's almost a, it's almost as rich of an aroma as, as some cheese, right? Um, so I've had a really great time uh, learning different ways to use sourdough discard in different recipes. And now I'll open it up for questions. Hey. Thank you so much for this presentation. This I think was really helpful. Um, I, I guess uh, people can, if you have questions, you can type them into the chat box. We have a few coming through. Um, and then I also saw that some people have been typing questions into the QA box as well. Um, not quite as many. Um, and just as a reminder for anyone who joined us a few minutes late, um, we will be able to share slides uh, with you guys over the next couple of days. So we'll send you an email once those get posted. And um, we're recording the video as well, uh, but that may take us a, a couple of days to get posted, but we'll definitely keep you all in the loop. And um, in the chat box, we also shared the website to Dr. McKinney's lab, the Dunn lab, um, to, so you can learn more about their citizen science project and how, you know, their, their website has a recipe for a sourdough starter, some tips, and more info if you guys would like to create your own sourdough starter and then share your results with Dr. McKinney's lab so that she can study um, how everyone's differ. Um, I will go ahead and drop that into all panelists and attendees again because I know sometimes links can get lost in a very active chat box. Have you been curating questions or do you want me to just scroll down through and try and answer as many as I can? Uh, you can scroll down through, and I have a question as well, too. I was wondering if you could expand on. Uh, this is related to one of the questions we got in the QA box, but you list, you know, Teff having lots of the pediococcus and amaranth having the lactobacillus and other grains, you know, having different bacteria. So is it our understanding that lots of these different bacteria is a good thing, and do we know much about the impact of one versus the other might be, or is that something your lab's studying? Uh, that is a really great question. So let's see. We know from a completely other project that I summarized a little bit in 2018, the Global Sourdough Project, um, that in a nutshell, we collected 570 starters from participants in 17 countries across the world. Um, it was very Western centric, just as that disclaimer, like unfortunately we didn't get a lot of samples from um, like Pan-Asia or from Africa, right? Um, or from South America. 
So it was, it was very United States, Canada, Europe, and Australia. Um, but with those disclaimers, it's still a heck of a lot of starters. <laughs> um, so with that project, we found, that's how we really found out that sourdough communities are very simple in that, you know, out of the about 70 types of lactic acid bacteria and about 70 types of yeast that we, we have found in any starter all over the world, right? The global set of sourdough microbes, out of all of those 70 types of, of bacteria or yeast, in any given starter, you tend to only have about seven or eight types mm. of uh, yeast on average. Right? So it's, it's a very narrow subset. And it, that makes sense to me as a gut person because, you know, flour, even whole grain flour isn't going to be hugely diverse in its nutrients, right? You've got starch, you've got fiber, you've got a little bit of protein and lipids, but it's not like any meal that we would tend to eat mm -hmm. as humans on a daily basis, right? It's not a balanced diet in the realm of all nutrients. It's mm -hmm. part of this complete breakfast. It's not the complete breakfast, right? Um, so we did find though that most starters tend to be dominated, like 90% of the bacteria will belong to one type. Um, and what we think from different behavioral studies that we did with those different uh, dominant types of bacteria, uh, it looks like those most dominant types are the ones that grow the fastest. And that makes sense to me because if you think about every time that you discard, every time that you feed your starter, it's kind of like mowing your lawn, right? So what are the plants? It's a disturbance event. So what do you do when you mow your lawn? You're cutting down and selecting against slow growing plants like trees and you are selecting for, you're favoring grasses, dandelions, all the weedy species that grow really fast. They have to be able to bounce back and be resilient. So the same thing for a starter. If every day or two or three times a day, I am cutting this community in half, then the only ones that are gonna make it are the ones that can grow really quickly, right? So I think those most dominant types of microbes tend to be the most fastest growing. Uh, does that answer your question? I tend to ramble when I get excited. Yeah. Have you noticed? Um <laughs> That's good. Yeah. And then I welcome you to scroll through any, wow, the QA is going up quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see, starting from the beginning, I'll, I'll get as fast as I can. So hopefully uh, Chris and Marcy back from, you know, three o'clock, you've seen that you can use gluten-free flours. I would not recommend coconut flour only because it is so absorbent, right? They, um, it would be very, I haven't found a good uh, like what amount of water you need to add to actually get the slurry instead of just a growing mound of rehydrated coconut. Um, but any grain that's milled, and I'd be interested to find out what happens with nut flowers, right? I think you mm. might get a little bit of rancid smell at the beginning. Um, it'd be very interesting to find out what happens with nut flour. But gluten-free grains, absolutely you can make a, a healthy, successful, mature starter with a gluten-free grain. Uh, Darian had asked, I thought you needed whole wheat flour as it contains more microbes than bleached flour. Um, hopefully, David Dowie here has uh, laid those fears to rest. You can, and I have grown a successful, mature sourdough starter with all purpose. I try to use unbleached just to take out one processing step, but I've had a lot of students grow successful starters with bleached flour too. Um, comparatively, you might notice that an all-purpose flour is not going to have the oomph. You know, maybe it takes a while to build up because it's lacking nutrients compared to a whole grain flour, but it is not impossible um, to grow a starter with a bleached all-purpose. Um, and AP is all-purpose. Um, Let's see, recommendations for containing the scent of the starter. Ooh, during hot summer months, I'm beginning with the starter covering it loosely and the smell takes over the house. Yeah, um, let's see, I have in the past just used like the lid without the ring and just put it most of the way over. Um, I would be a little bit nervous for a brand new starter that that might keep microbes from settling in. Um, 
I mean, I know a lot of people keep it on top of their fridge. <laughs> so maybe then if it wafts up, it's uh, all the smells are over your head. <laughs> I think that's more of a good luck. And, you know, all you really have to do is make it past the stinky days, right? Um, so to day seven or eight. Um, let's see, we have a question. Oh, the difference between a several year, years old and a newly fermented starter. So I have not uh, personally kept a starter for more than two years at this point, um, but there is evidence that these communities are tremendously stable once they're formed. So a two week old starter and a 20 year old starter, particularly if you keep feeding it the same way and if you stay in the same location, if all of your environmental conditions are the same, there's reason to believe that the community in a starter could remain incredibly stable. Um, but if you change the flower type or if you move halfway around the world or if something happens with your water, that's going to be a disturbance event where you have to, your microbial community would have to adapt. Um, so you can imagine, it just depends how much change you introduce, right? Um, Darian said it looks moldy. Um, the, oh yeah, I think you're talking about the buckwheat. Yeah, so the buckwheat, it is a really dark gray. Um, let me show you the buckwheat flower. So this is buckwheat flower. So when you just add water, it just darkens. So your starter may look different in the same way that, you know, Teff looks different. Um, your starter will have a different color depending on the type of grain that you use. A millet or an amaranth, a much lighter grain, a, a quinoa, I imagine. I haven't made a quinoa starter yet. That could be interesting if anybody has quinoa flour out there. Um, I think those lighter grains are going to look more like what we imagine as like an iconic starter, right? Made with white or whole wheat flour. Um, but the color of your grain would obviously affect the color of your starter. Um, and I think I addressed feeding it. Teff, Holly, uh, Teff is a type of gluten-free and Joanne. <laughs> Lots of questions about Teff. Um, oh, Sarah, you already addressed it. Fabulous. Um, so yeah, naturally gluten-free whole grain. Um, let's see. Marvin asks, is it important to stay with the original flour or can you alternate? Oh, that Great came up question. a lot. Great question. So you can, in practice, alternate all you want. Uh, I know a lot of bakers who like to start their starters with rye because it's such a, a powerful nutritional influx, or if, they're, if they find that their starter is looking a little weak sauce, you know, they'll just like toss in a little rye flour and they find it peps right up. Um, if you participate in the Wild Sourdough Project or the Sourdough for Science Project, I will ask you to pretty please keep the same type of flour for that full 14 feedings. That's because, um, we want to control as many inputs as we possibly can so that we know any differences in the microbes or in the behaviors of your starters are due to the different geographic region where you live or the different type of flour. But if you use a blend of rye and all purpose and sometimes whole wheat, then I don't know if you know, your starter is behaving or smelling the way that it does because of rye or all purpose or sometimes whole wheat. Does that make sense? So we want to control uh, everything that we can. So if you're doing the project, please just use one type of flour. Keep everything constant. If you're doing it on your own, use whatever you want. <laughs> you can experiment. Um, Maybe you have time for one more question. And then for people who continue to have questions, would, would the Facebook page you shared be a good place to ask questions or? Yeah, I think the Facebook communities are really phenomenal um, because there are so many people with so much baking experience. Mm -hmm. So there are four of us uh, scientists who have led these projects, but even the four of us would be completely swamped if not for the incredible community mm -hmm. of baking experts that's eager to jump in and share expertise. Yeah, I just okay. recommend the Facebook groups because they're amazing people. 
Okay, great. So when I send all you guys in the audience a follow-up email later this week with slides and the recordings, I'll also include links to the Facebook page um, where you can ask questions. And then I'll also include the links to the recipes that Dr. McKinney shared at the end. Um, for those of you who've started your project and you want to, to bake something with it. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. It's great tuning in and, thank and you. seeing you. <laughs> Let me get this set up. All right, everyone, I'm going to end the meeting now. Um, but again, you'll hear from me uh, later this week.